Alrighty then, let's make it official. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we come to God's word and study it, we ask the Holy Spirit's presence upon us, and we lift up prayer and praise to our God who gives us such great blessings as, uh, as his word and ways to sing and read it. So uh, let's give praise and glory to God. We're going to do so with hymn number 702. My faith looks up to heat thee. You've got it on your sheets in front of you, and I will put it on the screen here in just a moment. My faith looks up to thee, O land of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray. Take all my guilt away oh let me from this day be holy thine may thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart my zeal inspire as thou hast died for me oh May my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless, be a living fire. While life's dark maze I tread, and grief around me spread, be thou my guide, bid darkness turn to day. Wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. When ends life's transient dream, when death's cold sun and stream shall o'er me roll, bless Savior then in love. Trust remove, oh, hear me safe above a ransom soul. We continue on responsibly reading Psalm 4. The other side of your worship sheet. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned to shame? How long, how long will you love vain words to speak at us? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears Be angry. Do not sin. Honor in your own hearts. Offer right sacrifices. There are many who say, who will show us some good? You have put more joy in my heart than they have when they're green wine about. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. We'll see this psalm is very uh, close to what David is going to suffer, at least in part of what we'll study today. Very appropriate for most of us, too. 
we have times of struggle and temptation and difficulty. And uh, when you have those sleepless nights, it's a good idea to turn to the Lord in prayer and cry out to him because he's the one that can change that and give you rest and peace. So let's turn to him now in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in our life, for your promise that you are the calming, peaceful influence in us, reminding us that we are saved that we are your precious children in Jesus Christ, that we are covered by your robe of righteousness, we're covered by your protective blanket. Continue to be that in each one of our lives and be that in the lives of these that we lift up to you. Be with our sister Faith, who has traveled to Ann Arbor. And be with her mother Mary, who is in surgery to correct an aneurysm. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with Bob, that uh, the cancer on his nose would be able to be healed and we're thankful that he had cancer nowhere else in his body. Be with this family and grant them healing. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with all those, Lord, who are suffering in the Ukraine. We beg you to end the conflict, end the battle. Uh, bring peace to that region. Be with all those who are affected, who have lost homes, lives, and loved ones. Be with the refugees who are forced to flee. Grant them safety and grant them their needs. And be with those that are providing that refuge for them. Be with the doctors that are coming behind and trying to do the best they can. Be with the citizens that are there that don't have adequate food and supplies. Solve this problem, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with Karen, Lord, as she faces so, so shoulder surgery next Monday. Uh, may she have a peace of mind as she waits for it. And we ask that this procedure would be uh, without complications and result in her health and healing. And be with Ron as he will care for her as uh, she heals. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Heavenly Father, be with Dale, our brother. Grant him continued recovery. Increase his appetite. Help him to sleep. Restore him to health. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. be with our brother, Reverend Art. Grant healing to his ribs. May he be able to, uh, may they be able to fit him in for his CAT scan sooner than what it's scheduled and help him as he deals with loneliness. Bring people into his life to call and visit that he may see a brother in the Lord and be lifted up. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for our sister Karen for the successful surgery she's had in her recovery and that she and her husband are back to attending worship. Continue to grant her health and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for our sister Barb Pike and for all the ministry that she does. Even though she can't go out and drive places, she calls, she sends cards, and she encourages. Encourage her and strengthen her faith that she may continue this wonderful ministry. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I ask you to continue to be with me. Grant me healing head to toe, body and soul. And thank you, Lord, for the restful time off that I had. It was a gracious gift from you. Help me to... Uh, Go at my responsibilities this week with renewed vigor, physically and spiritually. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with our sister Joan. Grant her a peace of mind. Grant her a calming spirit. May, may the Holy Spirit come into her and grant and take control of her mind and her body. Remove whatever it is that's troubling her and give her true peace that's based on who she is in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. be with the Swanson family, with both children as they need uh, continued healing and recovery. Work that in their lives, Lord, and may you receive the glory. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. grant traveling mercies, Lord, to Greg and Terry as they go up north. Bring, take them up there. May they have a, a wonderful time and bring them back safely. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Be with our sister and brother, uh, Ken and Linda, as they travel down to Florida. May this be an enjoyable time away, relaxation and fun, and bring them back safely to us. And while Linda is gone, be with our sister Norma as she plays uh, for uh, all services for the next month or so. Grant her the strength to do so physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Be with her and lift her up. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. 
All of these things we commend over into your care, dear Lord, trusting in your great love for us that you showed by sending your son to die and rise again for our sins. And all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. We pray the collect of the day. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, instill in our hearts the love of your name, impress upon our minds the teachings of your word, and increase in our lives all that is holy and just. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, did you do that? Sure you did. Says Mark. <laughs> the card says it is uh is it is camera? administrative professional is this your camera or microphone yeah, yeah. that's a camera want to come over here in oh i can't see anything now you can there we go from pastor mark for our professional secretary's day uh, who Isn't is that sweet? pastor mark i think that was actually pastor Hunter because pastor mark would never do something like that. yeah no. beautiful beautiful you guys do a wonderful job thank you very much much and, I'm, and i got a spare keyboard and there it's on top of the uh, computer under the desk okay. on the corner that you can just take and take the little wi-fi thing out and okay, use gotcha. if you have to okay do you know where she's talking about because i I'll, I'll see it after I okay perfect Thank you. Did I get that because I sent you flowers? I wouldn't have got it otherwise. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> All right. Bible study. You may not remember, but we left off. Uh, we eventually would get to day four. We're on the verses for day four, uh, which is 1 Samuel 26 to 28. And we're going to turn and read through those chapters now. Uh, we're going to start with 1 Samuel chapter 26. It's right at the beginning of the chapter. I'll start. Hang on one second there, brother. You know that word. Appreciate your enthusiasm, but uh, I need to uh, fix something here. So... Right. All right, Tom, you're going to start off. Read me just the first verse. First one. Samuel, first Samuel 26, verse one. And the Zephites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David? Hiding himself on the hill of Echoliah, which is on the east of Jeshimon. Okay. Ziphites. Familiar name? Hmm? Familiar name, Ziphites, in relation to David? Can you remember if he had dealings with the Ziphites before? Which, by the way, we should probably recall what's been going on. So Saul was chasing David. Uh, David was one, on one side of the mountain. Saul was on the other. Saul got called away because the Philistines were attacking. He left. There was a period of peace. Uh, David goes and seeks uh, supplies from uh, some dude whose name is Nabal, which means fool. And Nabal shut off his mouth, and David was mad and was going to go destroy him. And his wife Abigail came and uh, calmed David down, gave him supplies. Nabal <coughs> has a heart attack and dies, and David marries Abigail and also marries uh, some other woman. And that's where we left off. So there's been this period of peace, and now uh, the Ziphites go and tell Saul where David is. Turn back to uh, 1 Samuel 23 for a moment. Keep your finger here at 26. This at 23. Yep, 1 Samuel 23, and we want to read verses 19 to 20. The Zippite went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Lord on the hill of Achillai, south of Jessam? Now, O king, come down wherever it is, 
where whenever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for handing him over to the church. So what have the Ziphites done once in the past? So to squeal. Yeah. <laughs> squeal. They squeal. Made, they betrayed you know, David's hiding place, I guess you could say. That, th this happened right after Jonathan had come to David and encouraged him in friendship and fellowship and strength of faith. And that's when this happened. And so they they betray David after a time of peace. David is at peace, and now here comes Saul. And once again, David's had a time of peace. And here are the Ziphites to do the same thing over again, don't they? It tells you that David didn't take revenge on the Ziphites. First time around. Okay, uh, Tom, continue on. Read uh, verses 2 to 4. So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakaliah, or Hakaliah, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshem. But David remained in the wilderness when he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David sent out spies and learned that Saul had come. <coughs> David sends out spies. I thought Saul had promised uh, the last time they met when uh, David cut off the corner of his robe that he wouldn't chase after him anymore. He I didn't lied. mean nothing. He lied. <laughs> Is David a little suspicious of Saul? <laughs> Quite sure a bit. Lot. Was that a lot? <laughs> yeah, a lot suspicious. And he has a right to be, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, there's a chance that Saul's there for some other reason, so David sends spies, but probably not only to ascertain why Saul has come, but exactly where he is. And there's a reason for that. We'll find out. Can you read uh, now verses uh, five through six? Then David rose and came to a place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay. And David saw the place oh, excuse me, with Abner, the son of Ner the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Joab's brother, Abishai, the son of Zanoah, who will go down with me, who will go down with me into the camp of Saul. And Abishai said, I will go down with you. It's uh, <clears throat> good to note that both Abishai and uh, Joab, Joab is kind of going to be the commander of David's army. Both him and Abishai are David's nephews. So they're related to David. What is David going to do? Go down into the cave. Try to talk to Saul. You think he wants to talk to him? No. <laughs> if we just ended right here, what do you think David's reasons would be? Kill him. Yeah. What was that, Art? Reverend Art? Sure. I didn't say nothing. Oh, okay. I thought I heard your voice. Sure. Oh. Very honorable. Yeah. yeah. It would be suspicious, wouldn't it? However, is he going in force? No. no. This sounds like a, a stealth mission of some kind, doesn't it? Tom, do you want to keep reading? Mm -hmm. uh, seven or somebody else, seven through 11. All right. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then he said to Abishai to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now, please let me Pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him. He shall put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. And David said, 
As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down in battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now of the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. Does this have a familiar ring to it? Yeah. History repeats itself. Keep your finger here and let's turn back to 1 Samuel 24. Let's read uh, verses uh, 3 to 7. 1 Samuel 24, verses 3 to 7. He came to the sheep pens along the way, a cave, where there Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke when you, he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with, with you as what you wish. Then David crept up under was cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscience stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for it is, he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his, rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Yep, here it is again, right? David is presented with another opportunity. Um, would this be difficult for David? Would this maybe be a difficult uh, decision? I want to say yes. Because it's one of the, you know, situations where I think maybe David is probably put up with enough but it's like uh, but and then he holds back here he is again David aren't you sure aren't you sure isn't the Lord giving him into your hand he did once before okay you didn't take advantage of it but now David here it is again here it is and he always returns back to the the most important point about Saul is because of the fact that Saul's the anointed of the Lord. He is the king at that particular time. And that means it's not David's place to kill him or take over or cut off the corner of his robe. <laughs> I was going to say maybe not to relieve himself. <laughs> David finds it wrong to defame or harm him in any way, doesn't he? Right. What does uh, his nephew mean by, uh, uh, I won't uh, now take this, uh, I, I won't strike twice. Let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. What is he saying? He'll only do it one time. I'll get him first time, right through the heart, and he's dead. He won't run away. No. Will he run? No. Not like a, like a certain supposed deer that somebody shot. Right. But that's, so yeah, David does uh, cite the Lord's anointed. Saul is the Lord's anointed, so I'm not going to harm him. And here's one of his nephews who is probably going to have a commanding role in the army when David actually does ascend to the throne. What kind of a uh, example is David setting for him? Good example. What is the lesson being taught here? Be patient. Yeah, the Lord will take care of you. Yes. But think about this whole idea of the Lord. What is David? Is David the Lord's anointed? He's a chosen. Yes, but he's not. Uh, he's not king yet, but he is the Lord's anointed. He's been anointed as the next king. Right. And when, king he is, when he ascends to the throne, he will be the, king. King. Anointed. the Lord's anointed. anointed. And so what kind of an example, if he was just said, it's okay, we can kill him. People get upset with David when he's king. Well, he said it was okay to kill Saul. Let's kill him. Must be okay to kill the Lord's anointed. There's a, there's a precedence being set here, isn't it? And it's a godly precedence, but it is. 
In David's mind, killing Goliath, was that a sin? No. It was a, it was a holy war. Right. And, and, and Goliath had blasphemed the name of the Lord God. And, and clearly the Holy Spirit was with David through this. If David was to allow Saul to be pinned to the earth and die, would that be a sin? Yes. Be murder. It would be murder. So he, David cites the argument of the Lord's anointed. What other argument does David cite in these verses? Verse 10. The Lord himself will strike him. The Lord's going to take care of it. And how does David think the Lord might go out and do this? Either he will die or he will perish in battle. Or actually it could be, well, those cover two, two things, but it could happen anytime and in any way. The Lord's not short of ways that he can rid himself of his enemies and bring judgment, is he? David showing great faith here? You think is he showing great faith? Yeah. More than I think than I would have. I might not strike Saul because I'm afraid the army would wake up and go after me. But uh, given the chance, after if I've been through what David been through, I don't know. David's hung in there a long time, hasn't he? But he hangs on this promise that the Lord will take care of it, that he will one day ascend to the throne. He's hanging on to that by faith alone when people that didn't have God would probably have given up on the promise, right? Even people with the Lord might give up. Tom, did you have something? No, you, you said exactly what I was thinking. So we got one more verse. I want to read verse 12. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. So is the Lord present and working through all of this? Yes. Yes, I think it's interesting I mean, for the, knowing the Lord's with him, but David and his nephew were, went in the middle of an encampment and then all of these soldiers could, you know, he didn't know they could Tag out and put them to a deep sleep. And he went right in the middle of all of them that they'd be sleeping and great that there's to do this. Perhaps the spirit had spoke to David or led David. He's I think David is there doing this at the Lord's command and approval. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think this is David working outside the realm of faith. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, it's yeah, it, take it, some kind of perpetrator to the middle. Your enemy can't. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of men to be in a deep sleep, right? Somebody should be guarding the king. I mean, have you ever heard when, uh, is, isn't there normally, doesn't the army normally have a 24-hour watch? Somebody standing guard at all times? Yes. Somebody should have been standing guard over Saul, and that will be it. Well, the Lord, the Lord put them all in for deep sleep. Is, is, is God testing David in all of this? Is that kind of a, let's see what the old boy will do. Sure. I think anytime we're, we're presented with temptations, we're being tested. And remember, in a test, God knows what we'll do. The, the, the re revelation comes within us. Realizing what we do. Will we act in faith or act outside of faith? And then... How quick are we to repent? And then the other question, I guess, that would come into my mind is, is does David realize that he's being tested or does he just rely on his own understanding? Good question. You, you can ask him when you see him in eternal life. <laughs> I, I kind of, if you read through the Psalms, I think he realizes that all of these things are times of testing in some way, shape, or form. And uh, 
he's very open and honest. Sometimes he rises to the occasion, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, him being the author of Psalm 51, which is a great repentant psalm, uh, where he lays bare the fact that he is a poor, miserable sinner, tells you that he's, he's of the repentant heart. He realizes that there's times when he's tested and he fails. Good. This part about uh, David taking the spear in the water jug, does that ring a bell in any way with what happened the last time he snuck up on Saul? And then what happened later on when Saul left the cave? So now he's taken the spear in the water jug. You think there might be something similar coming here? Yes. Exactly. And this spear, the spear, what has Saul done with the spear in the presence of David before? Do that. Yeah. Would that be a little bit of temptation? Abishai, take that spear <laughs> and stick it where the... <laughs> I mean, there would be a temptation there, right? This is the spear that Saul hurled at him. It kind of might be a temptation too to break it. Yeah. That's the first thought that I had. I can just see David going, ha ah, ah, and breaking it over. I see sweet justice, did. baby. You're going to throw this at me? Not at you missed. <laughs> we won't miss. We won't throw it at you. Let's uh, continue on. And uh, go back to uh, 1 Samuel 26. And we're going to read verses uh, 13 through 16. And David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer Abner? Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Who does David speak to and accuse? Saul? No. His general. Interesting, isn't it? But through all this, is he also attacking Saul? In a way. Saul, are you as safe as you think you are? And if the answer is no, why is Saul not safe? Because the Lord could let David come in later. In a, a very, uh, as far as Saul goes, who doesn't believe in the Lord, who doesn't have faith anymore, and Saul's people, what is David saying? What is David saying to Abner? You're not very faithful to them if you don't bury them. Dereliction of duty. Yeah, big time. You're supposed to guard the king. You're not doing your job. Where's his spear that was by his head? Where's his water jug? Where are those, Abner? Uh -huh, uh -huh. David snuck into camp and didn't kill him. And Abner and his men let him. Is David kind of a, by walking away and not killing Saul, is David actually more faithful? Protector of Saul and even these men are? Yes. Could have killed him and didn't? Yeah, yeah. Because the guy that was what David wanted to. Mm -hmm. He'd run him through. And so in this kind of respect, David's saying, you got a problem with your protection, with your army. You better take care of it. If it wasn't me and it was the Philistines, <laughs> this, it'd be a whole different story. But it is not only aimed at Abner, it's a roundabout way. And it's effective. And, and let's see how it is. Let's read uh, 17 through 20. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? 
And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what I have done, what evil is on your hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred up, stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is, if it is man, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day that I should not have, excuse me. They have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord saying, go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall on the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. What is David saying to Saul? Why are you chasing after? Because I have done nothing wrong. He's laying, he's laying it out, right? Here's why it's wrong for you to chase after me. I've done absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, what has he done? He spared his life. <laughs> Twice. Twice now spared his life. And then he asks, why are you doing this? And what are the two possibilities that David presents? Verse 19. Either it's the Lord telling you to come after me, or there's men telling you to come after me. You're men. If it's the Lord, may the Lord accept an offering, a peace offering, mm -hmm. which I, you know, David doesn't say, but it's kind of maybe he's sparing Saul's life. David didn't kill him. Or some other offering. However, if it's men, what does David say? And what is the reason? Is, is Saul being encouraged to chase after David by other men? Yes. Who would those men be? Well, the Ziphites told Saul where he was, but Saul's king. And the buck stops where? I would say it's probably not his advisors, it's all Saul. I mean, there were advisors at one time that said, you want, you want to do this to David? I mean, he, he was your big defender. He killed all kinds of Philistines. Uh, this is kind of directed, I mean, David knows the reason why he's being hunted, and it's really one man, and it's Saul. And then he says something else. What has been the result here? They have driven me from my share of the Lord's inheritance. What do you think that means? To be at the right hand of the king to, to learn what the king said. As a son of Jesse, would he have inherited something? David? Probably not. He would have received something. At, at least, if nothing else, a, a place to live in peace. He was the, the at one time uh, Saul's son in law, should have been able to live in peace. Should have been able to go to Jerusalem and worship the Lord in his, uh, well, the temple wasn't there yet, to worship the Lord at Shiloh in the tabernacle. Can he do any of that now? No. <clears throat> That's what he means by, uh, he said that they go serve other gods because he can't go and worship the Lord in the place where the Lord's called him to worship at because Saul's kept him on the run. So not only have you threatened me, you're threatening my eternal future by driving me away from my Lord. Then finally, he uses a, a unique kind of word picture here. Uh, has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. A single flea. Not worth very much of your time, is it? 
I'm not a hunter, but Ron, a partridge in the mountains? Be not a good place to hunt partridge. <laughs> <laughs> Might be better things to hunt than just a partridge too. Right. right? Any other comments on this? Let's see how uh, Saul reacts to this. Read verses uh, 21 to 25. I believe that's the end of the chapter. And Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life is precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. Let's stop there for a moment. What is Saul saying here to David? Basically apologizing to him for... He's confessed, right? I have sinned. But what else? That he won't harm him. Return my son. son. What does that mean? That he's bringing him back on the next minute. Come back. Come back, be a leader in my army. Maybe possibly come back, play the harp for me. Be my advisor. Be like as if my son. For I will do you no harm, because my life was precious in your eyes. Behold, I have acted foolishly and made a big mistake. Big, big time apology, confession of guilt, and apology, oh, yes. and asking forgiveness. So we haven't gone on any further. I mean, you can sneak a peek, but you think David's going to drop everything and go do that? No. <laughs> Why is it so? All right, go ahead and finish up. Read all the way to the end of the chapter. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. And Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David, you will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. So Saul said, hey, David, return to me. David not only returns to him, but what happens when the spear and the water jug gives him back? Does David take him over to him? No. You send one of your men over for it. Why is that? David doesn't trust him. Well, no, no. Yeah. I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. Two sides there. Is David talking about himself? For the Lord gave you into my hand today. Was David faithful and righteous by not killing Saul? Both times, yes. Yes. What about Saul? He wasn't too faithful. Yeah. So the Lord rewards every man for righteousness and faithfulness. David's going to be rewarded, but Saul? Yeah. Maybe a little hint there, Saul, you need to be faithful and righteousness. You need to stick with your promise, not the harm. And Saul departs, gives David a blessing. What do you think? You think this is going to be the last time they meet? You think Saul's going to go after David again? Yes. Actually, it is the last time. They'll never meet again that we know of. But maybe not because Saul held to his word. Maybe because Saul won't have the opportunity. But this is it. This is the last time. Yes, sir. It's, yeah, you, you can see, you know, like the fork in the road, Saul goes his way in. Yes. 
David goes his way and Saul returns to his place. Let, let's see the reasons why it, it, Saul doesn't have an opportunity again. David's got some, uh, he's got some things that are going to happen. So let's turn to uh, 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27, and let's read verses 1 through 4. David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over. He and the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maah, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at the Gath, he and his men, every man with his household. And David with his two wives, Jehovah of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. So what has happened just prior to this? Did David have kind of like a mountaintop moment with Saul? It was a kind of big time spiritual moment, wasn't it? Kind of like they settled things maybe a little bit. Realizing that the Lord is going to bless him, that he did the right thing. He didn't kill Saul, even though maybe he wanted to. It's kind of a spiritual mountaintop moment. But what happens right after that? What is David's spiritual and emotional situation in verse 1 of First Samuel 27. You're still on that mountaintop? One of these days I will be destroyed by the hands of Saul. Yeah, that's, that's what he's saying. So what is an emotional state here? Doubt. Doubt. He literally doubting. His heart is filled with doubt that his father is really going to keep his word. How about depressed? Yeah, chased out of his country. Depressed. I mean, he's he cited the fact. Remember when he went up when uh, uh, his uh, his nephew was going to kill Saul, and David said, "No, the Lord will take care of it." Is he still is he still voicing that now in this in this verse? Does it sound like he still believes that God's going to take care of Saul? Yeah. Saul's going to take care of him before that. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. Kind of lost that faith, didn't he? He's depressed. What voice is he listening to? The devil. Both, I think, are right. Himself and the devil's whispering in his ear. David, Saul's never going to leave you alone. You're never going to be king. Or at least you're never going to live. And David is kind of buying into that. And I wonder if I would too in this place. So he makes this decision. And what is the decision? What is he going to do? Where? Goes back to the first. Which? You know where he goes? Keep your finger here and turn back to 1 Samuel 21. History repeats itself. 1 Samuel 21, read verses 10 to 15. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Ba, but the ser servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David? The king of the land, isn't he the one they sing about in the dances? Saul had slain his thousand and David his ten thousand. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of God. So he pretended to be insane in their presence while he was in their hands. He acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting slobber, slobber run down his beard. Uh, Fifteen. Like I said to his service, look at this. Look at the man. He's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I 
sure, Reverend Edmund, that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on what lives in front of me. Was this man come into my house? So this is right after David leaves the uh, the tabernacle and grabs the sword of Goliath. And he's only had got a few men with him. I don't remember what it was, 15 or so. And he flees to Achish, uh, to the Philistines, to this king of Gath. The city of Gath is a Philistine town. And has to act like a madman to leave. That's here in 1 Samuel 21. Turn back to 1 Samuel 27. David ends his depression. Where does he go? Achish. <laughs> to Gath, the same place. And if you remember rightly, this is actually the birthplace of Goliath. Oh, goes back. Well, the people there remember him acting like a goofball, so he yeah. figured he was safe there. He is he is he acting? Do you believe in faith or in folly? Is is he is he using wisdom from the Lord here or human wisdom? Human wisdom. Because he he uh, he says I'm I'm not going to make it. I'm going to perish at Saul's hand. I I need to do something. There is nothing better for me to do. So I've thought about it, and this is what I think. And when we do that, and we ignore what the Lord wants, it may even it makes well in a way does it make logical sense? Because what happens when he goes there? Is Saul going to hunt him there? No, no. That part of it works, doesn't it? But to go back to the same place, you had to act like a madman to leave. Yeah, but that made it that, that made it a safe haven in a way. They said, "All right, Eric, well, come on in." <laughs> Here's that crazy. Thing. Here's that nut case again. It's just Except now he's, he doesn't go with five men. Verse two: How many does David go there with? One hundred. Six hundred. Six hundred. A little bit different situation going there this time. He's got some protection. Let's see how he's received uh, in Gath. So let's continue on and read from verse five to the end of the chapter. And David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns, and I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Till that day, Achish, is it Achish or Achish? Achish was. Gave him Ziglag. Therefore, Ziglag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites. Geshurites. The Gerzites. The Ger Gerzites and the Amal Amalekites. Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as Shur, to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say against the Negev of Judah or against the Negev of Jeremelites or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to God, thinking lest they should tell about us and say so David has done. Such was his custom and all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David thinking, he has made himself an utter stench to his people, Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. How does Achish now see David? Still see him as a madman? No. He sees him as a warrior, I think. A warrior, a, a, and servant. a servant, and an ally, right? He's not just a madman, he's skilled. He's a skilled leader of the army, and he's dangerous. And now he's not fighting against me. He's fighting with me, for me. But who are the Philistines? 
to the Israelites. Who are the Philistines to God? People that the Lord time and again has said, attack them, exterminate them. And where is David living? Maybe not such a good decision, is it? You look at this last verse, uh, Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people. So you think maybe the king has heard about what's going on between David and Saul? Probably. And he now thinks David's been doing what to uh, the Israelites? The Negev of Judah, of Jameelites, or of the Kenites, that, that's, uh, we can, uh, I think I have the uh, map ready. Let's look on a map and see where all these things are. Now, was David just saying he was fighting against those people, like, uh, against Israel, but he was fighting these others? But well, there's a good question, isn't it? So they would know. That's a very good question, Norma. So here, here's where he was, the wilderness of Ziph. They told him where Saul was. So he travels all the way over here to Gath and allies himself with the king of Gath, who's a Philistine king. And then he uh, doesn't want to live in the city, which is probably a good idea. And so they give him this town, Ziklag, here, which is where David and his men lived for a year and four months. He's attacking in this area here. Here's the Negev of the Jehoreelamites. Uh, what else do they mention? The Negev of the... So the Kenites, which would be here. See where it says the wilderness of the Kenites? There's a long way away from us. Well, he's, he's over and around in here. He's living here, and he's coming, and he's working in here. And Saul is way up here, somewhere north. So the opposite end of where Saul is. So he is attacking in areas that, that belong to Israel. Kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? Boy, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? For David, who's supposed to be king, to be attacking Israelites. Especially some that probably never did anything wrong to him. Let's continue on and move now to verse 28. I'm sorry, chapter 28. Yes, sir. It mentions all of these places but there were prior to these different locations is Negev of Judah Negev of Negev of what's the word Negev it's, it's uh, an area of the country um, it's kind of a wilderness region uh, it's part of what um, let's see here how long does it go this is the Negev so it's kind of the northern portion of where Israel actually wandered in the wilderness. It's a wilderness area. It's not exactly a desert, but there's not a lot going on down there. So it's the various areas of this place called Negev, which is wilderness. So that's a location. Yeah. A... But it's a location. Those places are all location within Israel. Within the Negev. This would be right here where I'm circling, where it just says Negev. This would be what he means by the Negev of Judah. The, over here would be the Negev of the Jehameelites. Mm -hmm. And up here would be the Negev of the Kenites. Okay. Good question. So let's move on and let's read in verse 20, uh, chapter 28, uh, the first two verses. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Akish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Akish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. How has the problem ramped itself up here? Who are the Philistines going to fight? 
Who has David aligned himself with? He's aligned himself with the Philistines. Right. We're going to fight against his own people. And what does Achish say to David? I expect you to what? Cut me in the army. You and your men go with me. Understand that you are to go with me in the army, which means David is going to fight against who? Israelite. His own people. David is going to be anointed as the future king of Israel. And now he's being told he has to go fight against them. I think David's kicking himself in the rear for his decision to go and stay there. Yeah. <laughs> Look here, we skip some verses. Yeah, there's something uh, back in verse in Samuel 27 I skipped over. So let's turn back to Samuel 27. This is in regards to what he was attacking. It sounds like he was attacking Israelites, doesn't he? But we missed something. I missed something. Um, going back to 1 Samuel 27, verse 8. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Gershurites. The Gerizites and the Amalekites, these are not Israelites. These are nomadic people that would come into Israeli territory and steal and pillage and kill and then leave again. So David is telling King Achish, I'm going in these areas. And he's being vague about it. And Achish thinks, well, good. He's going to attack towns, Israeli towns in there. But is he? No. He's attacking the enemies of Israel and killing them. And what does he do so that uh, this uh, Philistine king won't find out? He kills everybody, so they can't tell. There's nobody to come tell. Men, women, and children. Now, killing. Israel's enemies, and these are sworn enemies, and these are some of the people that the Israeli king, Saul, should be taking care of, but it's not. But killing women and children when you weren't commanded to, do you think that might be a problem? That might be a sin? Yes. If God didn't command it. <coughs> I don't have an answer for you there. However, when we get towards the end of the study and we see David's desire to build a temple for Yahweh in Jerusalem, and he's told, no, your hands are bloody, here you go. Hands are bloody. Anyhow, sorry, I skipped that over. So verse 28, um, back to there, the Philistine king said, hey, David, you're going to go fight with me? And David responds in verse 2 by saying, Then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. What does David mean? At least keep him in conquering the Lord's help. Keep him conquering the Israelites? It's a very ambiguous statement, isn't it? Can be taken a number of ways. It depends on where David's loyalty really lies. How does uh, the king of Gath take it? Akish. It's a good for just making this body there. Yeah. You will see what your servant can do, and Akish is saying, Oh, I'm going to see how many of your own people you're willing to kill. Awesome. If you're that closely aligned with me, you can be my personal bodyguard for life. David might not mean that, though. Because we're going back and remember, who was David attacking? Achish thought he was attacking Israelites, but he was attacking the enemies of the Israelites, of the Israelites who weren't really a problem for the Philistines. They didn't attack the Philistines. The Philistines were too strong for them. But it's a problem. It's a problem he's going to have to take care of, isn't it? 
Questions or comments up until this point? Just things on our own and not under God's thing. We sure can get ourselves into a lot of trouble. <laughs> yes, we can. Wasn't doing a lot of hard stuff here. He is. <laughs> And we're not going to resolve this problem in our study today, <laughs> but it'll come back around. We've got another episode. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to Saul here. So uh, continuing on in verse uh, 1 Samuel 28, let's read uh, verses 3 to 7. Now Samuel, Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp on Shunan, while Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp on Gilboa. When Saul, Saul saw the Philistines' army, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but, did, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams. Or error or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So, uh, what's up with uh, Saul? He's scared. <laughs> Look back to verse three. What does Saul know about mediums, and spiritualists, and necromancers? Are they good or are they bad? He thinks they're good. Well, they're not of the Lord. He expels them, right? He knows they're bad. They shouldn't exist in Israel, and there's a good reason for that. Um, and he expels them. But when it comes time to search for one, does he have any problem finding one? No. Because expelling these people didn't exactly seem very fruitful, did it? It didn't work very well. Maybe it was a half-hearted thing on his part. We don't know. Philistines come, and they're there in force. And how does Saul react? He's afraid. Panic. Panic. And who does he turn to first, or try to turn to first? The Lord. But the Lord didn't answer. Didn't answer him either by dreams. So Saul's trying to pray to the Lord. There's no answer in dreams. The Urim is that uh, stone on the breastplate of the high priest that was used to communicate with the Lord, probably by yes or no questions. That isn't answered or by the prophets. I thought the Lord was loving and gracious. Why is he not answering Saul when Saul cries out to him? It's false. Saul didn't really have strong faith. Let's take a, keep your finger here. Let's take a look back. Uh, first place we're going to turn is 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 26. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. This is early on. What is Saul's relationship with the Lord up here? Not very well. It's not existing. He's rejected God's word, which means I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to obey you. And in response, the Lord has rejected you from being king. At this point, maybe not rejected him totally. There was room for repentance on Saul's part, but he doesn't. This is a big warning to Saul. You didn't change your ways, right? Uh, turn ahead to the next chapter, uh, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What's Saul's relationship with the Lord here? Bad. Doesn't have one. Who does he have a relationship with? Evil. The devil. The devil. The devil. Turn ahead to 1 Samuel 22. Verse 
I'm going to read verses uh, 17 to 19. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priest of the Lord. The Lord. Louder, huh? Then the king ordered the guards of his side, turn and kill the priest of the Lord, because they have sided with David, and they knew he was fleeing, 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 yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were not willing to raise a hand to strike the priest of the, of the Lord. The king then ordered Joab, you turn and strike down the priest of God and the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put to the sword Nahum, the town of the priest that with its men and women, its children and infants and its cattle, donkeys and sheep. How far? That's it. Why is the Lord not answering Saul? Evil, evil upon evil upon evil. One of the greatest evil here is you killed the Lord's priests. Even when your very own men didn't want to do it, you found somebody. Not only killed the one priest that came to him, but all of the priests. And not just all of the priests, but their families and everybody in the towns they lived in. The Lord is gracious and merciful. To a point. Not only this, but how many times has David spared his life? Was there grace and mercy from the Lord then? Saul responded. He, he gave he gave a confession. He repented, but it obviously didn't stick to me. Now the Lord's not answering him. Yet he's scared. So where is he going to turn? Let's turn back to 1 Samuel 28. Someone who, what do you think, how does the Lord feel about mediums and necromancers? Necromancers is somebody that consults the dead. So cult. Talk about a cult practice here. Lord look favor on them. We're talking about seeking the power of Satan to know things that you don't know, to know the future. So I think we left off with verse 8, didn't we? Yes. Okay. Uh, 1 Samuel 28. Uh, somebody want to pick it up? Uh, verse 8 through 11. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And he came to the woman by night. And he said, divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I sh shall name to you. The woman said to him, surely you know what the Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the nec necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, as the Lord liveth, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. Uh -huh. So Saul disguises himself, goes to this woman who <laughs> he had banned, supposedly. What does he want her to do? Up Samuel. Bring up Samuel. And she says, okay, I'll do that, right? How does this woman respond to Saul? She knew that he was Saul. Surely you know Saul has said that anyone that does this must be put to death. I can't do this. You think she suspects something? Yes. She's somebody that is probably used to deception. Perhaps she really did call up evil spirits. She's not calling up the spirit of the deceased. That doesn't happen. But she's in league with the devil. Could she maybe communicate with demons? Yes. Quite possibly. 
And who does Saul, Saul, interesting here, Saul swears by who? By the Lord. <laughs> the capital L, too. Swearing by Yahweh that she won't be punished for doing what is a commandment, breaking the first and second commandment against Yahweh. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, but your God, by seeking other powers outside of the Lord for things that only he can do. Yeah, swear by the Lord. <laughs> and then who does he ask for? Samuel. Why Samuel? He was. Up until the end, Samuel was kind of in his corner. In fact, you know, the Lord even had to say, why are you still sick and with Saul? I've rejected him. I'm going to have you anoint a new man. A man after my own heart. So Samuel looked at uh, Saul and saw a big tall man, thought this is a king himself, thought it would be good and right. And the Lord had to tell him, no, I, I look deeper than the outward. I look in the heart. So yeah, Samuel stuck with Saul for a long, long time. In fact, when after the Lord uh, uh, this uh, said that uh, rejected uh, Saul, Samuel's heart was broken for a while. Wow. So that's who he calls up. Let's read verses uh, 12 through 14. And the woman saw Samuel, and she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. And Samuel, well, okay. What's going on here? He's kind of worshiping Saul, Samuel. So a God. <laughs> a God, which Samuel. spirit. Spirit. Whose spirit? Well, Saul thinks that it's Samuel. He sees Samuel, but the devil. The devil is a deceiver. He puts on more faces than one or two. So, good chance if it's not Satan himself, it's a demon. We, uh, we'll get back into this next time we meet because we run out of time. But this, this is a big problem for theologians. Um, we, we firmly believe that once you die, you're dead, you don't come back. Yet here is supposedly the spirit of Samuel. Coming back with a woman who's working for the devil. Can the devil really cause Sam? If it really is Samuel, can the devil really cause Samuel to appear? I don't think so. We do know in extraordinary cases, people who are dead do come back. Jesus met with two dead guys on the Mount of Transfiguration. That was by the power of the Lord, right? Elijah, who technically didn't die, he had was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, but Moses died and was buried. And he's there with uh, Jesus, but that was by the hand of the Lord. Notice this, though. Um, verse 12. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. She saw Samuel. Has she done anything yet? Any indication she's done kind of any incantation? No. It's like... Uh, uh, Saul said, bring me Samuel, and all of a sudden, there he is. And how does she react? All of a sudden, she realized. Out the top of her. Cries out in a loud, you think she expected this to happen right then? No. No. She was quite surprised. <laughs> very surprised. And also now very scared, because not only she sees Samuel, she knows who this man is in front of her, and it is Saul. Okay. 
there's something supernatural going on here. And this is not the spirit of Samuel alone. This is something else involved. There's some kind of supernatural entity that's at work here. And the question is, who is it? And I'm going to let you ponder this. And I don't have a definitive answer, but there's some things that we can look at as we continue reading through the chapter. And there's arguments on each side. Questions or comments? Sorry, we have to leave it here. But... Come back next week. And yeah, come back next week. <laughs> How's that for a cliffhanger? You can go ahead and speculate. I'm, I'm not going to lead you one way or another, but you can speculate on what actually is happening. Well, it's, it's, it's either he or she's making it up because Saul doesn't see Samuel. He hears his voice. So she could just be making it up and imitating Samuel. That'd be kind of hard. Could be a demon. Could really be the spirit of Samuel. The first one's not very likely. The other two is where we struggle. And why would we struggle with it actually being Samuel for real, his spirit? Because I don't think when you die, you come back. You don't come back, and, and who is it that's there? Kind of, who did Saul go to see to uh, bring Samuel back? He went to see? I mean, I mean devil worshiper so somebody in league with satan that's a big problem if it's really samuel isn't it and there are people who use this verse to kind of say well the lord's not against all kinds of fortune telling or consulting of the dead seances and medium because here you go problem is that there's various scripture passages that stand firmly against that and we'll look at those next time Okay, something to think about. Any final thoughts, comments, or questions? Well, here's just one thought. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> Good. I hope you enjoyed the study. Um, tell your friends, neighbors, and relatives about it. Coming up, and uh, we have a, a, a congregational meeting at the end of this month. If any of you would be comfortable, either in written form or personally standing up, I would love to have somebody besides me. Uh, say what Bible study means to them. I'm sure that there's a lot more people that are available this time of day that could come to Bible study that don't. We just uh, went through Easter celebration, right? Where we realized the joy that we have and what Jesus Christ has done for us and the hope we have in his resurrection. And for how many people for so many people, all they can give Jesus is an hour on Sunday, an hour and 15 minutes. If it goes an hour and 20, it's a problem. <laughs> a little facetious here, but I am being serious. When you consider all that Christ has done for you, you can only give him worship on Sunday morning. You can't come before earlier on Sunday. You're coming anyway and, and be involved in Bible study then or during the week. Rick Wolfram, who came and started us on this uh, Stewards by God's Design, uh, I talked to him recently again and he reiterated, says you, you have a right to expect 100% participation in Bible study. You need to be in God's word. If not here in this building at home, with your spouse, with your friends, Doing devotions, I recommend in the morning at least, or in the evening at least. How many people actually do that? How many people fail? I fail to pray at night. So, people get tired of hearing it from me. Reverend Art, what do you got there, brother? Give it to me. Oh.
for the for the shut-ins or the busy people, we now have the portals of prayer on your phone for ten dollars a year. It takes about fifteen minutes, and they not only talk and speak the the uh, devotion. They uh, you can scroll down and you follow along in the Bible verses. They read an epistle and a gospel, or a gospel and a and a psalm every day. And many times, if you don't want to quit, you just let the psalms go, and they'll read psalm after psalm after psalm. If you have the time to sit there and uh, you want to really get into the Lord's word and hear His word and pray back to Him. There, the song. It's on your phone. Ten dollars a year. Portals of prayer. Just go to Concordia Publishing and ask them to enroll you and subscribe to the Portals of Prayer. It's a wonderful thing. It, it just takes a few moments out of your time. How many people spend at least an hour clearing off their computer or their phone messages and their texts? in the evening and they could spend 10 to 15 minutes on that portals of prayer it doesn't take long depends how long the psalm is and it tells you how long you got to listen you hit, put your finger on the psalm and it comes on the screen it says psalm 23 one minute and 20 seconds and so it starts a reading i mean it don't take long and it lifts I could not be where I am if it wasn't for the portals of prayer 60 years ago when I became a Christian. Every day I read the portals of prayer. If not at home before work, I read it on my first coffee break. They will serve you and, and provide you with a, a, a good Christian education. At least get you started. Is CPH paying you to be a spokesman? If not, they should. You did a wonderful job, brother. We still recording. I yes, I will bring that up at the congregational meeting, though. That's a yeah. great idea. Thank it you, is. Sir. It's so easy. It's wonderful to sit there after breakfast. I I do it. If if Glenda doesn't come before this is over, I've got this phone right in my pocket, and I'll put it on. Tom, did you want to say this before or after recording stops? Oh, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, we'll pray and we can say a few things afterwards. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you've put in the hearts of these assembled here at home and here in the fellowship hall to study your word, a love for your word. And I pray that what we study today will lift all of us up and draw us closer to you. There's been law conviction on our part, Lord, but there's been grace and mercy preached grace and mercy that look forward to you, your son coming and dying for our sins and rising again. The hope that David had rested in that and the one to come, which would actually be from his line, you, Jesus Christ. When we are like David and we give up and we're feeling hopeless and, and struggling to trust you, come into our life with your word and your spirit, reinvigorate and rejuvenate us. Forgive us for the bad decisions we make like David. Intercede. Correct our wrongs. Don't make us suffer for all that we should suffer, and you don't. May we know your love and forgiveness, and may it live and abound in our hearts this day and forevermore, so that we can be a witness to that to others. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody have a great day. Thank you. See some of you tonight, 7 o'clock, Revelation.